Hi, everyone. I'm Shanali Basak. I'm a Wall Street correspondent for Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg News. I'm so excited today to be joined by Elizabeth Stark. She's the CEO of Lightning Labs, a company she founded in 2016. Barron's has also named her one of the 100 most influential women in finance. So, uh, you know, without wasting any time here, Elizabeth, when you founded this company, did you imagine that you would get to where you are now by 2021? And perhaps maybe you can explain a little bit about kind of your mission um, in building a decentralized network. Definitely. Um, so I've always been an internet geek at heart. Uh, that's something that I've, I've loved. Back when I got my first computer, um, when I started building websites, all of that. And to me, what I'd always wondered was, the internet enables people to you know, send and receive information, connect across the world. That's all commonplace to us today. But the idea that you could access something like Wikipedia, this incredible resource globally, where previously you had to go, say, to a library, and if you were in a small village somewhere around the world, you wouldn't have access to that. Well, the internet democratized access to information. And I'd always wondered, why wasn't this possible with money or value on the internet? In fact, um, the early creators of the web, including Tim Berners-Lee, envisioned in the early 90s that it would be possible to embed payments and value on the internet. So when I first learned about uh, Bitcoin, I was actually in the academic world. I was teaching at uh, Yale and Stanford universities. I thought, first of all, this sounds really interesting. Will people actually use it? And then they did. Um, but to me, I saw the potential for this new type of internet, this internet of money, internet of value that was global, that anybody could build upon, and that would enable all sorts of new use cases. So I, I often like to kind of see a couple of years out and live in the future and started this company back when, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency were not really cool. Not that many people cared. People told us we were crazy. I like that, by the way, that's motivating. And um, just saw that in the future, it was obvious that you would be able to natively send transactions, value, and money on the internet. Something I actually really care about is the creator economy. I've always been passionate about music and creators. And I wondered, why couldn't you just send you know, a couple of dollars to your favorite band or DJ or photographer? So in starting Lightning Labs, I really foresaw what I think we're seeing today and will continue to see, the idea that you can natively send and receive transactions on the internet using Bitcoin as a technology. Yeah, I'm curious about how Lightning now works with mainstream companies. I mean, you were mentioning, you know, years ago, you wouldn't have been, you know, imagined how quickly some of this technology could start to be adopted by some of the biggest consumer brands in the world. Yeah, so what we've seen has been um, an incredible 2021 thus far. We're really hitting an inflection point. Um, as a reminder for those that may not be as familiar, Lightning is a software layer that operates on top of Bitcoin that enables instant high volume transactions with low fees globally. So you can send and receive, the fees can be a fraction of a cent. You can actually send less than a cent for a fee that's far lower than that. And it's also decentralized. You can think of it as kind of a decentralized Visa transaction network where people can send and receive. And we've seen a whole host of startups. We have hundreds of startups, thousands of developers building today on this technology. They're building these applications, much like in the early internet, people built on the World Wide Web, you know, mentioned Wikipedia, Google, everything that we know today on the web. So what we saw initially was all these startups building on the technology. You know, they're new, they're nimble, they're able to build these new applications, everything from video gaming to podcasters to commerce, e-commerce, trading, all the interesting financial use cases. Um, but now we're seeing a lot of interest from larger players. So as an example, Twitter uh, recently integrated Lightning uh, late September in terms of tipping for creators and, and people on Twitter using a very cool app called Strike, uh, which is one of the applications built on top of the Lightning Labs tech. We build developer infrastructure. Um, Jack Dorsey, one of our investors, as founder and CEO of Twitter, also Square, has uh, Square has been great in terms of Lightning adoption. They're working on a variety of Lightning technologies. Um, they've mentioned that they are very bullish on that in the future. So we're seeing now these larger players come in, but also a number of startups that are, are just getting started. In fact, many of them couldn't even exist without the technology that Lightning enables. Well, that's a great point to bring up, this idea of the creator economy and how this kind of new financial ecosystem is making business possible for not just new creators in art and music, but also new developers who want to create new businesses. What does that look like? 
So one of the really exciting things about the world that we operate in is it unlocks opportunities for people globally. And one of the, my passions is emerging markets and not just for developers in Silicon Valley, although you know those are great, but to really open up opportunities for anybody around the world. So as an example, we see a lot of developer activity, both in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's a great founder named Bernard Para who built an app called Bitnob in Nigeria. They announced their Lightning integration a couple months back. They're now doing hackathons and engaging the developer community in Nigeria and neighboring countries as well, um, and getting a lot of excitement there. And one really key element that people may not realize is in a lot of these emerging markets, um, not everyone has, you know, access to a debit card, a credit card. Um, you know, El Salvador recently adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. Only about 20 to 30 percent of people there even have access to a bank account. But what so many of the people have in these markets is access to a mobile phone. And a mobile phone means that you can actually use Bitcoin, you can use Lightning, and you can use the network effects that come along with that with a phone without having to go through these legacy systems uh, with Bitcoin security the liquidity of Bitcoin, the fact that Bitcoin has hundreds of millions of users globally around the world, um, and then you have the instant high volume nature of it. So for developers that want to build, instead of having to go to their regional kind of you know, banking APIs, they're able to do so globally and then tap into users that can then connect to this anywhere around the world. You know, you had mentioned that Lightning is a layer that operates on top of Bitcoin, but we're also seeing so many different technologies that are kind of being built around this ecosystem. How do you uh, decide when it's time to kind of integrate with Ethereum or integrate with a different type of cryptocurrency? I mean, how do you think about the ecosystems that you operate in as this entire environment evolves so rapidly? Yeah, it moves so quickly. You really can't keep up every day. I'm like, what, this thing happened? That thing happened? And my team, they, they keep up on Twitter because I honestly cannot keep up anymore. <laughs> um, but that said, as a company at Lightning Labs, we are focused on Bitcoin. And this is actually because of the network effect that Bitcoin has and that then Lightning further enables. And I highly recommend that people uh, read my good friend Lynn Alden's piece on Bitcoin network effects. Um, she talks about Metcalf's law, the idea that as an individual user joins a network, the value of that network grows exponentially. And if you're going to break a network effect, if something's going to come around and be, say, a better Bitcoin, you actually have to be 10x better and provide so much of a better experience that people will leave something. Bitcoin has you know, the most security of a blockchain today. It has the most users, you know, hundreds of millions. Um, it has the most liquidity and obviously the most value. So you know, there are unlimited number of possibilities in this broader cryptocurrency ecosystem. But as a company, we are focused on the Bitcoin angle and the network effect um, because that actually is what a lot of the developers want. It's what a lot of the users want and it's interoperable with the other users. Now, Bitcoin is really going for what I call decentralized money. And what we're building is this uh, native protocol for value for people to transact on the internet. And there's a lot of other stuff going on in other ecosystems. But to be honest, there's so much for us to build in the Bitcoin world. Um, as mentioned, you know, with nation states adopting this technology, I didn't have nation state adoption of Bitcoin and Lightning in my cards for say, you know, mid 2021. We at Lightning Labs are still a team of about 25 people. So we're now building the developer infrastructure um, at Lightning Labs that is powering a lot of what's going on. For example, at Starbucks, um, Pizza Hut is actually very popular with people paying with Bitcoin and Lightning in El Salvador. And these major companies and retailers. So there's a lot going on there. We actually have a lot more in store in terms of bringing other forms of value uh, to Lightning and using the Bitcoin network. So right now we're focused on that. Yeah, I'm curious. You mentioned El Salvador a couple of times now, and, and now you've brought it together also with that consumer aspect, being able to pay for your pizza in Salvador or help with the help from the Lightning network. So how do you see this continuing to evolve? And what are the limitations still, especially in developing countries? Great question. Um, so the way that I see it, you know, people in the US say, OK, it's not hard for me to buy a coffee, right? I can go to my coffee shop. I might have my you know, Visa, debit card, Amex, et cetera, maybe cash, although that's you know, less and less popular these days. But in many other countries, you don't actually have these networks. You don't have people, particularly in emerging markets, that are going to have access to them, but also the fees are quite high, right? For a merchant to accept 
payment with, say, a credit card, the fees could be something like 3%, 300 basis points. Now, there was this incredible tweet um, in El Salvador on September 7th, which was the day that the law went into effect, making Bitcoin legal tender and requiring businesses that had the technical capability, which is any major retailer, to accept payment in Bitcoin. And this is largely over lightning. And so that tweet was somebody paying at Starbucks, you know, a couple of dollars for a coffee over lightning. And the fee was five hundredths of a U.S. cent. So imagine you're thinking, OK, three percent versus five hundredths of a U.S. cent. And even with the technologies we're building in the we have financial products at Lighting Labs, the fees might be something 10 bips or something like that, right? It's less than 90% cheaper than the existing networks. And we also have the capacity to reach billions because of the open monetary network that we're building with the broader Lightning ecosystem. We're one of a number of companies building on this technology and building the infrastructure. And as a result, people can tap into it in a way that they can't just tap into existing networks. And that's what the power of having a mobile phone is and bringing Bitcoin and Lightning to billions. So what about, you know, the, this idea of fees and friction, you know, covering the banking industry for a while. Now you realize how old <laughs> a lot of so old a lot of this technology. And if you are, you know, you are you are are finding a better mousetrap. So at what point does the traditional financial ecosystem start to change in a bigger way now that we can know that it's done more cheaply and with less friction? I think that's a great question. I actually think we're seeing emerging markets leapfrog, kind of like with mobile networks where they didn't have landlines, where people were able to have mobile phones and they didn't actually have to wire for landlines. And my friend Nelly Mensa, who's um, Ghanaian, Canadian, Russian, um, she has a really great uh, insight in terms of what's going on in these emerging markets and the leapfrog frog effect. And the idea there is they don't actually have the legacy systems. But for example, here in the US, we're still in 2021 using paper checks. And that kind of just blows my mind, right? That we have the internet. Mine we have too. had it <laughs> for you know, decades. We're able to instantly send uh, information, but we're sending pieces of paper, right? So that needs to change. Um, even the idea that ACH settlement here in the US can take days, especially if it's a long weekend, there's a holiday. Um, bank hours, you know, the idea of nine to five, you know, the internet's global. Bitcoin is a global technology. You know, Bitcoin never stops. Lightning is a global technology. So with the emerging markets, they can actually move forward and adopt this technology. Now, one thing I will say is Lightning is only about three years old. We actually launched a number of the developers launched the first versions of Lightning for use with real Bitcoin in 2018, right? And Bitcoin's first uh, major use case, I like to call Bitcoin the asset. That was just the buy and hold, what a lot of people are familiar with. But what Lightning enables is Bitcoin, the monetary network. And it's still early days. So it really is like those early days of the internet. You know, it's not perfect. It, you know, there's still developer kind of features to build and things to work out. But the amount of progress we've seen in going from, you know, zero to nation states has been incredible. And, and for a number of users, this is a big opportunity for them. And they're actually able to now accept digital payments when previously that wouldn't have even been an option. So we're really excited to be fostering that. Um, I know there's more we want to get through, but I do love this question from the audience about mining because our audience member th thinks that mining is one of the biggest stumbling blocks right now. And so do you see more innovative approaches to optimize mining, especially when it comes to energy and the real estate footprint? Yeah, so importantly, Lightning is a layer two that's operating on top of Bitcoin. You can think of it as, say, there's a Fedwire and then there's, say, a Venmo or a peer-to-peer -peer network and ACH on top of it. So on Lightning, there's actually no mining. People run what we call nodes, which are like servers on the network. And we have uh, tens of thousands of nodes already on the network today, which is important, by the way, because the idea that something like both Bitcoin or Lightning, Lightning can go down is not really feasible in the sense that all of those nodes, both on the Bitcoin uh, base layer and then on Lightning, would have to go down. You'd have to have basically no internet, which is different than, say, some other blockchain ecosystems that have gone down substantially lately. Now, mining occurs on the Bitcoin base layer. But one key element, people like to talk about the energy usage of mining. The way that I think about it is there's a lot of clean energy. Not all energy is equal. And the cost nature of mining 
drives people toward the clean energy because that's typically going to be most efficient and you want to have um, the cheapest energy possible. Now, what Lightning actually does is make Bitcoin transactions far more efficient from an energy standpoint because you only need to go to the Bitcoin blockchain once to get onto Lightning and then once to get off of Lightning, but you could transact an unlimited number of times in between. So you actually can amortize the cost of those Bitcoin transactions in terms of value and also energy over so many transactions that the ultimate goal, and I believe we'll get there, is we can be far more efficient than the existing financial system when it comes to energy usage. There's also a very cool company called Crusoe that a friend of mine started in a number of these upstream data as well that actually are carbon negative. They're using excess energy um, by the oil and gas industry to mine such that that would otherwise be released into the atmosphere. And instead, they're actually mining with that energy. So it's helping the environment. So I want to also get your thoughts here on the idea of the internet out of money. This uh, term that you've given me, your, what, what your goal is here, and how that fits into some other language we hear when we think about cryptocurrency, which is Web 3.0. Exactly. So when I first started this company, you know, being the internet geek that I am, I envisioned the ability to natively transact on the internet. And one of the really key things that Lightning itself enables is for anybody to build on top of this, much like they could build on the internet. It's an application layer because you can have these instant high volume transactions with very low fees. A lot of the use cases that we've seen emerge today include gaming. People love sending and receiving Lightning payments in game. For example, at the Bitcoin 2021 conference, over the course of two days, there was an esports tournament where 50,000 transactions were sent amongst the participants, and people are, you know, sending and receiving, earning money in tournaments. But that's also gone global. Uh, gamers in Brazil are really into Lightning these days, and they're actually making more money uh, using games developed by a company called Zebedee than they would in a job, right? And they're able to earn by playing. So you're mixing kind of the fun and the work. Um, but what the Internet of Money means is you can natively send both data and value and payments. So, for example, there's a very cool chat application called Sphinx Chat, where you can both send a message and you actually send a payment together with a message over the Lightning Network. So people are using Lightning also to send encrypted data. You can also send what we call streaming Satoshis. That's the ability to send... Uh, SATs, as we call it, the lowest denomination of Bitcoin, fractions of a cent, to podcasters, to creators, all of the things that I initially envisioned when I, in 2016 as I was starting this company. Uh, there's one very uh, great engineer named Andy Schroeder who actually reverse engineered his Tesla and integrated lightning into his Tesla, such that he paid for charging. Um, this is something that we've actually tweeted to Elon Musk. I know he likes to talk yeah, about crypto. Yeah, you hear back? <laughs> exactly. They embedded uh, lightning payments um, into the Tesla charging in the Tesla itself, and the Tesla can actually read uh, the signals, and he can pay for charging with his Tesla. Um, there's another cool company called Impervious that's building what we call a layer three a data layer on top of Lightning that enables people to build things like VPNs and other forms of sending data over the internet where you embed a payment. Machine-to-machine uh, -machine payments, APIs, you can actually send a payment with Lightning and authenticate. You don't need a username or password if you think about a number of, say, API-based companies or technologies regarding, say, machine learning and AI. You actually just pay, and once that payment arrives, the API will know that that payment cleared, and you can do that millions of times uh, per second, and that's part of what Lightning as a technology enables in the future. Elizabeth, what do you want? And, you know, I, I realize this is really only a three year company or so. What do you want to be in the next five years? Great question. Yeah. I mean, in the earliest days, right, in the 2016, 2017 days, we were a couple people in a co working space coding away on this protocol. And the way that I like to think about it is, First, we had to build the rails, and now we're really building the train, right? We're growing the team. We build a number of liquidity products and financial use cases that operate on top of the Lightning Network. But the way that I see the future evolving is people in the community and Bitcoin like to talk about number go up, that, you know, the idea that the price goes up. We focus on number of people go up and the idea that we can bring this technology to billions globally. So the way that I foresee it, much like the way that the internet became ubiquitous amongst you know, the world, and it took a while to get to you know, the emerging markets, uh, Bitcoin and Lightning will become ubiquitous as the internet of money. But importantly, a lot of people will likely not even know that they're using this. It'll be abstracted away, kind of like people don't know that they're using these base internet protocols, IP, you know, TCP, HTTP. 
And that's great. And the goal is to really provide people with access to both send and receive, to send this globally, to make it as easy on the internet as it is today to send a photo, but to do so with money and value. To see a whole host of new use cases that weren't previously possible. You know, we talked about uh, the Tesla use case, self-driving cars, machine to machine. The way that I look at Lightning is it enables two classes of exciting use cases. The first is those that weren't previously possible. And the second is those that previously did not have access, like the whole emerging market use case. So five years out, the goal is really to get to the billion plus to make this technology ubiquitous and then to do uh, what the internet did for information for access to financial services and value, which is really to democratize it and make it accessible to people globally around the world. Elizabeth, I couldn't thank you more for your time. I hope to be able to catch up with you again very soon to see how this is being adopted all across the world. Uh, again, that's Elizabeth Stark, the CEO of Lightning Labs, and uh, I'm Shanali Basic, a uh, financial correspondent for Wall Street. Uh, for Thanks so much. This is a super fun conversation.